Thank you for being on time. I'm going to briefly illustrate the material for this week, week 11. And then I'm going to show you once again the instructions for this week's assignment, which is essentially the last weekly assignment. After that, all you have to do is work on your final project, which will also provide you with the content you need for the presentation you have to give before the end of the semester. I hope this will be enough. I have a new smartwatch and I still have to learn how to use it. So hopefully it will not bring it down. And uh, most of today's lecture will be an introduction to the themes of this week's book about the automobile, which is Luigi Barzini from Peking to Paris, which is an account of a famous endurance race about 10,000 miles long from Beijing, China to Paris that took place in summer of 1907. On Thursday, I will mention a few things about the final exam. Under week 11, you'll find a sample question and some suggestions about the final exam and some details about the format of the final exam. And I will answer any question there might be and will watch some scenes and the conclusion of traffic on Thursday. So, here is... Week 11, as you can see, the focus for this week is this book by an Italian journalist who was well known throughout Europe and who had visited the United States as well and written numerous articles about the United States, especially about the railroad system. He was, among other things, an expert in transportation and transportation infrastructures. And so the Italian newspaper he was working with paid a handsome amount of money to have him as a passenger on this vehicle that was made specifically, was custom made for an Italian aristocrat, Luigi Marcantonio Francesco Scipione Borghese, I'm missing one of first names he had, of course, coming from a real aristocratic family dating back to the Middle Ages. So the Italian newspaper paid handsomely to have him travel on this automobile, and this is a reproduction, a sculpture that was placed in a Russian town that they traveled through on their way from Beijing to Paris. During the race they won, they were the first ones, the first crew to get to Paris in about two months. But you may notice that there is only room for two people up front, and those were the driver and the mechanic, Scipione Borghese and Ettore Guizzardi, and there is no room for a third person. You could place someone in the back, but the back is occupied by huge gasoline tanks, right, one on each side, and you can see that there is a sizable trunk because they had tents and other materials, and in the back you can see on top the oil tank, because of course they need to refill these cars were using a lot of oil, burning through a considerable amount of oil and water, because of course you need water for both, both for the engine and for survival of the crew. So. The journalist traveled in very difficult conditions, taking risks and uh, mentioning more than once how he could fall. And at some point, they did have an accident and the journalist hit his head, uh, suffered a serious trauma and then continued nonetheless. Okay, so you're finding here the PDF of a presentation that I will use 
to illustrate the themes in this book. And next week, I will comment on specific passages from this book uh, that you find inside this presentation. And the other links you see here are mostly for your curiosity. If you want to know more, uh, you can read the article on Barzini himself from Wikipedia. And if you can read Italian, this would be the best biographical entry you can find. You can also read about the aristocrat who uh, uh, was the owner of the car and one of the two drivers. And a little bit about the race, but the article about the race is kind of short on Wikipedia. You can find better articles in here. Uh, this is an article about another driver, uh, and uh, you, you can find out about his adventurous participation in the race. Charles Godard went to a Belgian automaker, Spiker, and uh, convinced the owner of this automotive factory to give him for free a car uh, modified, although not as heavily as the car that won, to participate in the race together with spare parts and tires. Um, but the problem is that having a car was not enough. They had to ship the car to China because the race for from China to Europe. So this guy went to Paris, sold the tires and the spare parts, uh, bought the passage for the car to go to China, got to China with very little money, and there went to the Dutch consulate saying, I'm racing a Dutch car in this race and uh, uh, you should give me money for fuel uh, because he had no money and, and 10,000 miles in front of him with cars that didn't have such good mileage. And he promised that the automakers would refund that money to the consulate. So the consulate gave him 5,000 francs. But before he could get to Paris, when he drove in Berlin, they arrested him. Because in the meanwhile, the Dutch consulate found out that his promise that the Spiker factory would pay them back was in fact a lie. And they sued him. For, for fraud, for defrauding the Dutch government. So he could not finish the race to Paris. He had to send another driver and a mechanic on with the car while he was arrested and detained. We don't know how long, but six months later, he was on to another race, this time from New York to Paris. But just to give you a sense of the times. Ettore Guizzati is uh, a very interesting character. We'll discuss him just a little later, he was the mechanic of the winning car, the Itala, but apparently did most of the driving, really. Certainly he drove longer stints than the aristocrat, than Scipione Borghese himself. And you can find here some brief articles with images that give you an idea of the car itself, since you'll be reading excerpts that talk about this car, you should have an idea. The car can be found today, can be seen in the Museo dell'Automobile in Turin, Italy, which is the largest automobile museum in Italy with, with some uh, rare cars, including this one. And in here you find some uh, specifications including the size of the engine, which was seven liters. And uh, the speed, it's calculated here as roughly 55 to 60 miles, but it's, it's really difficult to say what the speed was on the car at that time when it was produced. The car has four speed, certainly could reach roughly 50 miles per hour, maybe more, we don't know for sure. The car was restored and it is functioning. In fact, the car in 2007 went back to China. They took it out of the museum, put together a fleet of supporting vehicles and drove the car 
in exactly 63 days, the same amount of time the Itala took in 1907 to go from China to France. In about two months, they drove this car from 1907, restored from Italy all the way to Beijing. And they, of course, within their crew, they also have uh, uh, people who shot a documentary and you can find videos online for, for that. So just to give you an idea of how sturdy this car was and how well it was built that even a hundred years later they could drive 10,000 miles and it was not all highway simply because it was 2007. They still used plenty of dirt roads. And here too you see the big tanks for the gas, the tanks in the back for the oil and the water. Even the article from Wikipedia has a lot of pictures and you find another article uh, in the next link. I'll show you these two videos before I start my discussion of the themes of the book, but this is a picture from 2007 of the Itala going back to China once more, traveling. Um, we don't know exactly how many miles were traveled by during the initial race of 1907. 10,000 miles is an estimate. We know they didn't go straight to Paris because by the time they got into the European part of Russia, they had such an advantage, such a lead over the other cars, that they were invited to go to St. Petersburg, and they did. They accepted the invitation to be celebrated by the people in St. Petersburg, and then they drove back down uh, to go through Central Europe and eventually get to Paris, where they had this huge celebration. The entire city of Paris went out to celebrate the winning crew they had merchandise being sold, pictures of the car, postcards celebrating the events, etc. And from the success of the event came the idea to write a book that was almost an instant book. The book was written in just a few months. It was ready by the end of the year and translated in several languages. By 1908, it came out in French, in English, but even in Hungarian, uh, and in Spanish, etc. This is the section about the final exam. You can review it. I'll use it on, in class on Thursday. And uh, this is, of course, the section about the film, which is still uh, traffic. And readings for November 17th are the only assignment. There are no additional uh, written assignments. I just want to review with you this week's assignment, which is due by... Friday, which is based on the final project, is to get you introduced to the standards of the final project. And the foundation for the project is to find a good story to include in your project and to uh, use the template for the project with. So the idea is that you go back to the page where you find all the information about the final project. But you don't need to use the template at this time. The template is for the final project, not for this week's assignment. Okay? If anything, you just need number one. Because the, the core of this week's assignment is show me that you can find at least a decent short story about the automobile. So in here, under number one, which is the only part you need, you find some suggestions on what to do, what not to do. What is a short story that is good enough? Because you can find short, very short stories in these magazines that would not be suitable for the project because they don't articulate the characters or the story or the use of the automobile. Would a story that's about a page long be long enough? Usually, yes, but it's not just a number. The number of words 
it's also how the story is developed and more importantly what is the role of the car in the narrative itself the best example as i uh, provided in class earlier would be if you just have a story about characters who at some point simply get on a car to go from their house to a restaurant that is not a story in the automobile because it includes the automobile the automobile has to be somewhat instrumental or have enough focus so that the story is talking a lot about the automobile to be significant for the understanding of the culture of the technology of the automobile during that time but again the, the, the purpose of this exercise is exactly to address that issue because you have found that story, you put it in the assignment, and then all you have to do is not to use the template, all you have to do is, this is the link to the story I found, the title of the story and the author, and then I'll explain, you should explain in a paragraph or two why you think this story would work in your project. Not go through the template, but simply say, I think this is good for my project because it's a story about a couple falling in love because they had an accident or uh, she was stranded and he stopped and fixed her car and the common interest for the car made them a, develop a bond and by the end of the story, they're getting engaged, right? And I can click on the link, check the story and tell you, and this is the perfect example of what should be included in your project and you can use the story in your project or tell you well there are some elements but it's not the strong example that you can find or no this is not good enough for the project you should find something else okay so this is an opportunity for you to get feedback which is why I specified that you can find between one and three stories. It's up to you. You, if you have the time, you can get feedback from me on more than one story. And having a plurality of examples here should not be a problem because all you have to do is include a paragraph or two where in simple, in simple terms, you explain why do you think this is a good choice, okay? And, Basically, for this kind of assignment, you don't have to worry too much about the quality of your writing because the purpose of this is to advance to the stage where you can start working on the final project because you have an understanding of what makes a good story for the project and possibly you have already, after this assignment, one or more stories that are good enough and then you proceed phase two with the application of the template to the story and you select the passages you want to present during the oral presentation and the oral presentation at the end of the semester is basically a show and tell right it's not a paper again it's you explaining what you found relevant about one or more of the stories in your project, put it on Zoom, on the screen, some passages, and reading, discussing, analyzing those passages and the story overall, right? And again, the presentation is supposed to show how well you can discuss the elements in the story, the culture of the automobile, it doesn't have to be a very formal presentation or a comprehensive presentation of your project. I know that by the time you present to me, your project might not be finished, which is not even a bad thing because the presentation is another, the second opportunity to get feedback from me so that you can revise change your angle or understand the template better etc right and and then you have a little bit of time before the final exam the calendar has all the dates to complete your final project which 
will go as everything else inside the Google Docs file shared with you. But this time, for the final project, past the deadline, that file will be closed. It will be viewable by you. You will be able to view the file, to comment on the file, because I'll, I'll leave there uh, the comments on the project. I'll leave there, I'll place there the grade for the final exam and the other grades, great for participation at the end of the semester. Everything will be listed there, but past the deadline for the submission of the project, unless you were granted an extension, that file will not be editable by you. Okay, keep that in mind. This assignment two, if you need an extension, if you're not ready by Friday because this was a hectic week for you and you need the weekend, let's say, to find a suitable story, just let me know, okay? I can be flexible about this, especially about this because I'm more interested in being able to provide feedback rather than uh, giving you a big fat zero for not doing this assignment, okay? It's just that you should do this so that you, as soon as possible, so that you can advance to the proper project before the busiest part of the semester, okay? So, this is where you find the assignment is, is what? Uh, week 10 is where you find the descriptions the instructions for the assignment. More importantly, use this document with the format and the methodology for the final project because in here you find a series of links from various magazines which are the places, the archives where you're looking for a story, right? It's important you understand this. You don't look for this short story by open, going to google.com and putting short story on an automobile. Because you will find all kinds of stories, not stories from this period that we've been focusing on. So this is where you go and then you open any number of these links and inside you can use keywords to find a story or you can quickly flip through the pages until you see a title that you think would be a nice, good story for your project or you see an illustration because some of these stories come with illustrations and often you can also download the PDFs if you want to just do this offline or you think it'll go faster because you don't have a good internet connection, right? It's up to you. And there is no magic number. You could find all of three stories in one of these links. First thing would be to explore, to get a sense of where you would like to work or where it comes easier finding stories. And then you proceed, okay? So the, this is a good time for questions. Although Thursday, if you have additional questions on this assignment, we can also talk about it. But you have an opportunity right now to ask questions about this assignment. The most important thing being, understand that this is just about finding the story. The final project, which is more complex, is something you'll do later. This is just providing me with <coughs> one or more links and some arguments of explaining why those are good choices to get feedback from me, right? So make a good effort. Questions? Okay, you're good with this. So I'll ask you again on Thursday. And again, don't hesitate to ask for more time if you need more time, because this is important. And in this case, especially the deadline is secondary. Although you don't want to do this on November 20th, when the presentation might be uh, 10 days later, okay? And we'll talk about the presentation again in the days to come, but I don't want to include everything today. So let me go back to week 11 just to show you 
a couple of videos with the Itala, because in many ways, inside the book by Luigi Barzini, the automobile is a character, is one of the protagonists. There are plenty of passages discussing the car, right? The car, in many ways, is the hero of the story because it takes these characters, these real people, halfway across the, the globe, right? Uh, uh, traversing two continents, doing something that seemed impossible or would have appeared to be impossible just 10 or 20 years earlier. So it's good to have an idea of this kind of car. So keep in mind that they would often in 1907 advance very slowly. They would usually drive 10 or more hours per day. The guy that convinced the Dutch automaker Spiker to give him a car, Godard, for example, we know that he was so far behind the other cars that at some point he drove for 29 hours to catch up with the other cars before crossing from Siberia into Russia. And if you ask yourselves, how can you drive for 29 hours? Well, for sure, plenty of coffee, but they might have used also other ways to, uh, other, other chemicals to keep awake. And as I said, this is a PDF that you find under week 11 online, was based on a presentation that I gave in the past at a conference. The core idea of this book from, it was written in 1907 and published in English in 1908, is speed as a new dimension for humankind and something that all humans will need to adapt to. And speed is what is being provided by the technology of the automobile. However, keep in mind that by this time, 1907, a train was even faster than the Itala driving at around 50, perhaps 55 or 60 miles per hour. The idea though is that there is no feeling of speed in a train and a train is not an individual technology. That is to say the train or any other means of transportation from the period, hot air balloons, uh, uh, especially uh, ships, was not being given to the individual, was not being provided as an extension of the individual life of the user the way the car did. And it's interesting, I took this from a passage that uh, is found in the book, Speed is associated with the idea of vertiginous delights. It's associated with the idea of vertigo, meaning that this experience takes control of your body and mind, right? Vertigo is, is the sense that you're losing control of your balance, but it's also something that you feel not only in your body, but also through your mind as well. And the addition of the word delights means that this is a positive experience. It takes control of you, but the reaction to it is so exciting that you are motivated to repeat that experience. That you are getting habituated to the new technology and therefore the assumption in the book is that the future will be a world inhabited by all sorts of technologies where humans live in symbiotic relationships with the technologies, right? Where the user and the technology become one. And this conjunction, this connection is not just intellectual, it's psychological and at the same time physical. So it's body and mind that are affected by the experience. 
this, right? Which is why, in the end, the introduction of the car in society is not about being more effective at transporting humans or supplies with vehicles as opposed to horses and carriages. The book is about nature a lot, right? They go across China, Mongolia, Siberia, and that is most of the description of the journey. Really, with, if you include the journey through the first part of Russia, you have 80 to 90% of the pages in the book. So this is also a book about an exotic kind of journey through a landscape that few readers of the time would have known directly. So keep that in mind. It is written from the point of view of a journalist who's writing for readers who have limited knowledge of this part of the planet. I've described the notion of symbiosis, this idea that the journalist on this card can appreciate the, the depth of the symbiosis that develops between the human and the machine, but more importantly, the book is about this idea that in 1907 the world is about to experience an anthropological shift, a radical shift where in Darwinian terms, the surrounding ecosystem, the ecosystem in which all humans will operate, will be inhabited by different technologies, the plane, the automobile, trains, etc. And therefore, either they will adapt to this new technological world, or they will perish metaphorically, meaning that certain social or psychological types will not be successful in society based on their inability to interact with machine. And, and we are seeing the long end of this revolution, right? With the digital revolution and the digital shift. And we can see how well people around us of different age, ages can uh, interact successfully with those technologies, right? <coughs> So one of the core topic is this alleged relationship between the automobile and evolution. And if Darwin had provided the foundation for the theory of evolution within the world of animals, his ideas were very quickly adapted to human society. And the best example, not just in Italy, but across the world, including the US, was Cesare Lombroso. Cesare Lombroso was an anthropologist, was a criminologist, and he was studying the physical features of humans. Often he worked inside Italian prisons whenever they gave him permission to measure the physical characteristics of prisoners or he worked with soldiers because the uh, local authorities, the military uh, hierarchy would give him permission to do those measures on the soldiers. And sometimes he recruited people. For example, at some point he studied the porters in a city in Northern Italy. His assumption, which was, he thought was intrinsically Darwinian, was that even within human society, you're bound to find different human types that correspond more or less to the place these people occupy in society. For example, for criminals, because he was for, first and foremost a criminologist, he thought that most people he would find in a prison, not all of them, but most of them, were there for a reason because their nature was such that it predisposed them to crime. And he believed that for thieves, for murderers, for prostitutes. So instead of recognizing social factors, even though he didn't totally, completely ignore the social factors, he really believed 
in this idea of a natural hierarchy of society, of the members of society. If you uh, spend your life carrying big loads as the porters in this northern Italian town, it means that your natural type is made for that kind of function, that kind of role in society. In the case of criminals, his dream, his wish, was to find a, some kind of scientific formula through which he could measure an individual and then alert the authorities, this individual can be recognized as a criminal type, so before he turns into a criminal, he or she, we can take measure to re-educate this individual. He really thought that there would be some kind of scientific discovery that would enable him and others to identify potential criminals. And at the same time, if you find that, then there is no end to the use of this uh, scientific methodology because you can also identify potential geniuses and give them the resources to become successful and give their genius, commit their resources to the betterment of society, right? And all of this is part of a continuity in the sciences from the end of the 19th century to the first half of the 20th century with other theories such as eugenics or the various theories that you find within fascism or in Germany in the 1920s and 30s of the perfect race. Who is the perfect exemplar of uh, the Indo-European or the Aryan race and who are instead the uh, second-rate humans that should be marginalized uh, or even destroyed to keep society in a state of perfection. That is to say, a series of assumptions that from the area of science go quickly into society and politics, right? Affecting the way uh, uh, societies are organized politically. For example, to give you another practical example, uh, during the second half of the 19th century, based on Lombroso's theory, there were some conservatives, po conservative politicians in Italy uh, coming up with this idea. We should use scientific methods to understand who is predisposed to learning at a higher level and then use this to exclude some people from education. If we can do that, establish a scientific grid, then we know that some of the children should have a fifth grade education, no more others could advance because we know by studying them physically and psychologically that some of them are predisposed to becoming professionals with a university degree or leaders and others were made by nature to become manual laborers, to become peasants, to be used as the lower end of the workforce in any society. So you can see that from uh, this uh, pseudo-scientific theory, you immediately go into a heavy ideological view of society. In the book, there is a lot of emphasis on the various ethnic groups that the crew of the Itala car comes into contact. So strangely, in a way, instead of just being a book about this car, which is so powerful, so nimble, as you've seen, uh, that they can travel from China to France and go on for 10,000 miles or so in two months, instead of the, being about the car, about the driver, uh, the crew on this car of three people, Scipione, Ettore, and Luigi, the, the owner, the mechanic slash driver, the journalist. This book is a lot about the people they encounter on the way and their reactions to the car. Why? 
because based on that idea of an anthropological shift in society, the journalist wants to provide the answer to the question, what will happen to the various people they encounter in China, in Mongolia, in Siberia, from different ethnic groups, once even their ecosystem is invaded by technologies. But the same is true for Italy or France. What will happen to French society or Italian society when those places are inundated with technologies? Instead of just a few thousand cars, you have millions of cars. How will people react and adapt? Therefore, the description of the reactions of the various people to their sometimes first encounter with the automobile is an indication of how well their race, based on this assumption that every race has a different mindset, different predispositions, different talents, how well would that race adapt to moving from a rural existence based on agriculture um, and, and traditional functions to a technological society? Will they be able to learn? Are they well disposed towards this technology? And the answer is largely positive. Keep in mind that these theories about the existence of different subspecies within human society, the idea that most people at the lower class level are there for a natural reason, same for middle class, upper class leadership, etc. And then the exception should be captured through scientific observation. That is to say, if I see someone from the lower classes who don't belong there, I can identify them and take them, uh, give them the means to better mobility. This idea was not just applied to different races, different ethnic groups, but was applied within society. So the interest is to see the assumption is that even within European societies, some people are better suited for this technological shift that will happen in the near future. Okay, so the, what is the modality of the modern world? It's not just about technology. Keep in mind what I said at the beginning. It's also about speed. I thought my voice was so loud that people couldn't sleep with, but I guess with headsets you, you can. So speed affects everything we do. Once you experience speed on the car, it doesn't stop there because speed becomes the emblem of society, including what we do professionally. And in fact, at the very beginning of the book, you don't find the car right away. You find Luigi Barzini, who's at home, reading the books about the railroads in the US, and he gets a phone call from his director, Albertini, who was a famous newspaper director at the time, and he says, come here right away, and Barzini takes a taxi cab, goes to the newspaper, and the director says, you're about to leave for a trip. You go to the United States, you go to New York, uh, from there you go to San Francisco, from San Francisco you go to Asia, to China, to Japan, and then to China, and in China you'll, you'll get on board a car and travel all the way to Paris. When are you leaving? Tomorrow or, or something like that. So speed becomes the staple even in the life of a journalist, right? It's something that permeates society. Modern society changes that way. The new ecosystem is, of course, the ecosystem in which technologies are prevalent and the new mindset is can I be comfortable with the technologies? Can I develop a strong symbiotic relationship with the technologies? If so, then I'll be good in this future ecosystem, otherwise I'll have problems, which would be like the kind of symbiotic relationship you may entertain with your phones, right? with people sleeping with their phones in the bed, not even on the nightstand, or people not being able to separate themselves from the phone or the internet for more than an hour or a day, etc. Okay? And 
the automobile creates a new culture and of course a new language of companies that change. So when inside the book, which is full of pictures taken by Barzini, we find pictures uh, like this, we can appreciate the symbolic value of this kind of picture. At some point, there are no good roads to travel toward, I think it's towards the end of Siberia, between Siberia and, and the U European Russia, part of Russia. So, lacking good roads, they ask permission to drive on the tracks, on the train tracks, which means that trains have to be stopped. But keep in mind that the owner of the car was a prince who was part of a European aristocracy. He knew people in France, in Germany, in Russia. He spoke Russian, among other languages. So, for example, he was able to interact with the Russian peasants when they needed something. So they asked permission, they waited for permission, and finally from the Russian ministry, they received permission to use the railroad tracks. And, but then this picture becomes symbolic of the automobile replacing the train as the chief means of transportation, okay? And the guy here is, of course, Witsardi, the mechanic slash driver. And in the back, you find the prince, and you can appreciate how impossible it was for the journalist to travel on the car. Where do you place a third passenger in here? Because see how much stuff they have on top. At this point, I've removed these pieces of woods that also worked as rudimentary mud guards, but they have tents, they have supplies. So either you precariously uh, stay in the back or you can <coughs> sit here and put a, uh, your, your foot there. So, but there was very little space for the journalist. Imagine traveling 10, 12 hours during a day in those conditions. You can also see how many spare tires they had. And the key, really, to the success of this car during this uh, very long race, besides the technical quality of the custom-made car they had, was the fact that the prince, Prince Scipione Borghese, being a rich, wealthy man, prepared everything in advance with his money so that every 100 to 200 miles on their itinerary, they found spare parts, tires, oil, gasoline, which was not necessarily easy to find in China or in Siberia. So he had everything prepared months in advance. The race was announced in January of 1907, and they left Beijing for the, the start of the race on June 10th. So he had a few months to get ready. But of course, especially during this time, you had to replace tires quite often. This is the prince. This is the image of him that you find at the beginning of the book, before the introduction. And the introduction is purportedly by the prince. I'm convinced, though, that Barzini wrote the introduction, he consulted with the prince, he probably got his permission, submitted the draft for review, but I think the introduction itself is assigned to the prince as a homage by the journalist to the man. He, in Barzini's ideology, the prince is really the perfect human being. Right? Or, in other words, the perfect demonstration of this idea of the natural hierarchy in society. The idea that if someone like him is found in the top echelon of society, it is based on his natural qualities and the qualities he developed. But at the foundation, you find allegedly the qualities that nature endowed him with. And what are the qualities that make him like the perfect modern 
man, the perfect specimen of modern humankind. The fact that he is an intellectual, but also a very pragmatic man. That he can understand complex issues, but also a man who's able to decide and take action. And also good physically whenever the car and the troubles with the car demand uh, physical action. Which is why you see him well-dressed, reading a newspaper at the beginning of this book, because they need to confirm that he is also an intellectual and not just a pragmatic, brave kind of hero that you find him to be through the book. He's also, in a way, an entrepreneur. He has an entrepreneurial mind. Because after all, the book will tell you how he has the car specially made with requests made by him based on what he knew of Asia. Before the race, he, he had already traveled through the Middle East and Asia, so he knew a little bit about the terrain. So he has all the qualities, allegedly, that a good modern leader should have, according to Barzini. So, from the very beginning, you have this idea of an anthropological observation of human specimens, one of which is the prince himself. Then, you have the mechanic, and he's a very interesting figure. Ettore Guizzardi uh, uh, got connected with the prince in an adventurous way that is explained in the book, which becomes an allegory of the new man born together with technology. Ettore Guizzardi's father was a train engineer, and one day when the train was traveling through central Italy and Ettore was accompanying his father, was in the locomotive with his father, the train derailed just a few miles from one of the villas of Prince Borghese. His father died in the accident. He, who was 10 or 12 at the time was taken together with other wounded people to the villa to uh, uh, be rescued, to be uh, attended to, tended to medically, etc. And once the prince learned that he had become an orphan and that he had been spending time with his father on the train and therefore had a mechanical turn of mind, to borrow the phrase from the phone, uh, from the first example um, of the uh, short story, what is it, von Teuber, something like that. Um, so that he is predisposed to the understanding of modern technologies. Once this is clear, then the prince becomes his mentor <coughs> and almost a stepfather. The prince sends him to mechanics shops to learn more about the automobile, takes him on long drives because the prince had an automobile early on. He was a pioneer in the use of the automobile. He will send him to work for Fiat at the Fiat factory to learn more and later on sent him in the army in a unit with motorized vehicle. So in a way, what is allegorical about the origin story of this character is that he is born out of the destruction of the train and from that he advances to become the perfect man to exist in a symbiotic relationship, symbiotic relationship with the automobile. Often Luigi Barzini will portray, describe Ettore not only on the car, being able on that car to feel whether the car is do, doing well or not, because through the vibration, the smells, and, that, and the noise, Ettore can say whether the car needs maintenance. But when they are resting, Barzini is often portrayed laying under the car, looking at the car, apparently not doing anything rather than contemplating the car, right? So he exists as an extension of the machine itself, it seems. So that even during his free time, he spends that time in the car. By the way, the prince would die in 1927. 
but Ettore Guizzardi lived uh, longer, died in, 19, in the 1960s, became a minor celebrity in his small village of Budrio, and people or journalists would go and find him to have him tell them the stories of this race from 1907. And this is Luigi Barzini, himself a pioneer in journalism. What he pioneered is the field of journalism about foreign affairs. He spent most of his time traveling and sending, sending back reports, not just about picturesque events, but about the evolution of other societies. His idea, and you can see from the portrait that he is being presented as an intellectual primarily, his idea is that the journalist, this kind of journalist, is supposed to provide the ideas that the leaders, the good administrators and leaders of a country need in order to support reform and advance the progress, the growth of a country. So he saw journalism as a social mission. And from that point of view, his goal with this book was to provide information about the conditions of the road, how well a vehicle can travel through all the areas that they uh, drove across, and also to provide information about the potential commercial and military uses of a vehicle with an internal combustion engine. So his book is not just a form of entertainment, it's not just made to sell because they had become minor celebrities, but it's also meant to provide information that the leadership of the industry, the leadership of the government, the military can use for their planning. So he sees themselves as part of the leadership ensemble, as part of the group of people who advance the growth of a nation. That's how he saw his journalism. He grew professionally. His journey was very successful in, the, in that not only he published articles during the journey, whenever they stopped during this journey from Beijing to Paris, they often stopped in places where the telegraph the telegraph station was present, and he would send him his articles. His articles were published in Italy, in France, in Spain, in England, at the very least. So he was a global success. After this event, uh, he continued to become more successful, had suffered some setbacks in terms of reputation during the war, World War I, because he was sent to the front line, and he gave a very positive description of what was going on in 1917, when a lot of people on the northern front fighting against Austria, a lot of Italians were dying and suffering casualties. And so he was too much pro-government in his report of, about the war, and he became infamous so notorious among the soldiers that the soldiers of the Italian army came up with a song against them to make fun of him. Later on, he became a supporter of fascism because he was convinced that journalists had to be working with the government. And by the end of World War II, he was disgraced because he was considered a collaborator of the fascist government. He died right after the end of the war. But by then, his reputation was, was down to zero, and uh, he, he was forgotten or, or criticized. This is the beginning of the story. You have a French newspaper called Le Matin, and notice how speed figures out in the context of this. This is a newspaper that is based on the last telegrams of the night, meaning Read the Matin because we publish the latest news who just got here through telegrams, thanks to the telegraph, from all over the world. I mean, the most recent news, the news that arrived 
more quickly to Europe. And next to it, in fact, to give a sense of the relevance of the telegraph, you have a telegraph pole with the various lines carrying the telegraph inputs. Now, in January of 1907, on the first page, they published this article that proposed a prodigious challenge to go from Paris, notice in this version it was from Paris to Beijing with an automobile. So they were suggesting that people write back to the newspaper to register themselves for this race. They would cover the race. This would give them an opportunity to publish daily reports on the race, and this would become a global event. And something prodigious because it, they were saying it's time to demonstrate that cars are so reliable and so powerful in technology that they can drive through this enormous distance. Later on, they decided to reverse the itinerary. And the why is related to the commercial side of this. That is to say, they had second thoughts because they thought, if the race leaves from Paris, the day the race leaves, people would not be very interested. And when they get to Beijing, very few Europeans will be there to celebrate, right? So they said, let's start from Beijing so that the, when people get to Paris, this will be also a city event. Because having all of the people in the streets to wait for the arrival of the winning car for them meant that they could send out people selling copies of the newspaper, right? Get the latest about the winner. Read the latest news about the arrival of the race. They had this in mind, as well as merchandise, as I said, that could be set, sold that day. However, after they reversed the itinerary, people had already registered by March. They had a few dozen entries, a few dozen people who were willing to try this race. The moment they said, no, it'll be from Beijing to Paris, almost everyone dropped out because you would have needed the money to ship the car and spare parts to China just to begin the race. They were ready to give up. When they received a telegram from Scipione Borghese himself, who wrote to them in French, saying, whether or not you do this, I'll be going to China, and I'll be doing this by myself if need be. Because he had already made preparations. He had already requested a car be made for him, etc. At this point, the prince himself was so famous, his declaration had such uh, success that they decided to carry on, even though, as you will see, at the end, only five cars, only five vehicles participated in this race. And this is the day they published the news that the cars, the vehicles had, had left uh, Beijing, uh, and this happened on June 10th. And these are the various cars. This is the Itala, with Prince Borghese in here. There was a tricycle because they thought the terrain is difficult, a light vehicle will not get stuck in mud. In fact, they were the first one to withdraw from the race. The Spiker is the car driven by the fraudster I mentioned before, Godard, the, the guy who borrowed money under false pretenses to pay for fuel, a couple of the Dion Bouton, and uh, these are the five drivers, and this is their itinerary through Manchuria, Siberia, Russia, and then through Europe, getting to Paris. <laughs>